Um, one of the uh, interesting things that's happened in <coughs> my own lifetime is the revival of interest and the use of psalms in worship. Psalms are basically religious poetry. They are liturgical texts. Their proper use is liturgical. Um, and one of the funny things that happens in church history is that in certain times people develop a kind of colour blindness. Certain parts of the Christian heritage are lost for some reason. And that in itself is an interesting question. Um, but then what's equally interesting is that uh, for some spontaneous reason, from a human point of view, but maybe by the work of the Spirit from God's point of view, uh, all of a sudden, all over the place, people rediscover the same thing. And one of these things that's happened without anybody pushing it, without any big movement, uh, is the rediscovery of the Book of Psalms right across Christendom and right across the denominational spectrum from the Pentecostal end through to the uh, you know, Catholic end of the scale is the rediscovery of the Book of Psalms. Now, that's what we're going to look at with you. Uh, now, um, uh, I don't want to have a lot of introductory stuff. Uh, just to first, a few things about uh, the assessment side of things. Oh, no, before, yes, there was something else I was going to say. Um, always when you begin a new field of study, it's good to get your head around it as a whole. So I would advise um, you, say, if you're doing, uh, a, say, the history of the Reformation, to go into an encyclopedia right at the beginning and read a short general summary of it. Now, what I'd like you to do now before work hits you is to read through, um, to get an overview of what we're going to do. Here there's a place for you. Um, of, uh, what is the basic text? Encountering the Book of the Psalms. An excellent introduction. The best one that I know of the Book of Psalms. Uh, I'll be referring you back to it as we go through occasionally, but I want you to read it through. Um, uh, it's very, very accessible. It's, an, uh, yeah, it's uh, not terribly heavy. It's uh, 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 very well written. To, to give you an overview of what we're going to do, um, so you can fit the bits and pieces that we'll be doing into a general pattern. So please do that. And if you don't do that, then go into one of the uh, Bible uh, encyclopedias and just look up Psalms, one of the recent ones. Um, if you want some help, I can show you where they are. Uh, and read uh, about the Psalms there. But this is far better than that. Now, if you can get hold of your uh, student unit outline, and Joel, you better have one too. Is there uh, that's, a spare that's a spare one there too. You've got that one? No, I've got a job here. Oh, thank you. Um, you can uh, look at this yourself, and I don't intend to go through it at any great length. Um, but I want to go through the assessment, because I want to go straight into uh, uh, the first unit of assessment. Um, now, what I'm going to do is to give you basically two kinds of assessment. The first kind of assessment is what I'd call formative assessment, in which I get you to do uh, hand into me three basic exercises um, uh, in which I don't get you to do an exegesis as a whole where you need to deploy the full range of exegetical skills but just to look at uh, two or three important skills that you need to hone if you want to make sense of psalms. Now psalms are poetry and you need to analyse them and read them as poetry. Um, and two of the most important skills that you need to develop are the uh, ability to see what the psalm says, 
to read the imagery of the Psalms. And that's going to be the first exercise. The second exercise is to be able to understand, to work out how the psalm works and what it does. Um, you know, a book of, uh, say, a psalm doesn't, is not meant to communicate information. It's not prose. It's meant to do something. And uh, unless you go to that side and work out what it's actually doing and how it does it, you won't do justice to the psalms. Now, the key to understand the way poetry works, or one of them, is the structure of the uh, psalm. Uh, the way it's arranged. Um, and then, uh, then within that, then, uh, to look at what the language that's used there does. Now, uh, today I want to focus on the uh, analysis of imagery, which will lead you then to the uh, first exercise. If you have a look at there, I want three analytical exercises to develop the literary skills needed for the exegesis of Psalms. Notice this is 40%. Um, and this, this is not going to involve a, a great deal of uh, you know, written work, but a lot of thinking and to develop your analytical skills. The first exercise is to uh, analyse the use of imagery for three different uh, uh, groups of people in Psalm 91. Imagery for God, imagery for the psalmist, and imagery for the angels. Now, by the way, the term psalmist is a technical term that's used by biblical scholars for the speaker in the Psalms. It's a notional term. The psalmist, there's no such thing as a, the, the psalmist. Um, the psalmist is the speaker in a particular psalm. The second exercise is to look at the literary and functional structure of Psalm 25. Literary means the way it's arranged as a piece of literature. And the functional is then how it works, what it's meant to do, what its function is. Um, the function of something is what it does. The third exercise is a combination of those two to look at the structure and imagery and the way these two interact in Psalm 103. Now, basically, this is, these are not essays, but I want you to do it in tabular form, and I'll demonstrate um, the first of this today. And then on Friday, I'll be giving you the, uh, demonstrate the other uh, aspect of it. Dr. Klein, yes. I've got the other 1,500 words, is that for the three together? The words? three together. Uh, and I'm not going to be fussy about that. I don't mind if you come in well under it. Because, um, uh, particularly for this exercise, um, the KISS principle applies. Now, the shorter the better, because you need to nail it. Say, for example, uh, I always find out that people who don't get it waffle. Mm -hmm. And if you get it, then you can nail it down in a, in a couple of words and phrases. You've got it. Huh? So, uh, you won't be given credit for your much writing. <laughs> um, <laughs> the second exercise is an uh, exegesis uh, that you will complete for me by the end of the course. Um, and connected with that, exercise, uh, with that exegesis, and you've got a whole range there of them that you can look for yourself, um, what's applied, uh, there'll be uh, some uh, examination, discussion of the, either the ritual or, uh, or social context of a psalm. Um, Ritual means now, the liturgical, now, how it works, how the psalm worked uh, within the temple in Jerusalem as part of the liturgy there, the ritual um, context, the temple context, uh, the uh, uh, social context is the uh, context within Israel and in the ancient Near East. Now, um, the dates there that I've given you I prepared this before uh, the finalising of the present timetable. Initially, I was going to teach you on Tuesday and Thursday. If you look closely, the dates here are Tuesday, Thursday. So if you put all the dates 
one day later as the due date. So uh, you don't have to chase me when I'm not here. You can chase me when I'm here. And I can chase you when I'm here. And then I've given you the assessment criteria, all the other normal stuff. Uh, as far as uh, the, the, uh, resources are concerned, um, you need three things, basically. Uh, number one, I'll be giving you course notes. So bring a folder along. Um, instead of me giving you a whole book of notes, I'll be giving you notes as we go. Now, the reason I'm giving you notes is so that you don't have to spend all your time um, focusing on getting stuff down, and also that I don't have to give you lots of uh, minutiae, yeah, little bits of data, exegetical data. You'll have that at your disposal. Um, so I'll be giving you course notes, and part of the course notes will be vocabulary lists. We'll be working with the Hebrew text, text. so just before we do a psalm, I'll be giving you a vocabulary. Now, I know this is cheating, and if in an ideal world I would expect you to go to your dictionaries and look up the words and work them out, but I'm realistic, and I've been teaching for many years, and know that if I require you to do that, there's going to be one or two students that regularly do it, but most of you won't do it for the simple reason. You don't have the time. You don't have the time. Look, I'm realistic. And I want to work with the Hebrew text, so, uh, uh, but what I'd like you to do then with the vocabulary list is actually to attempt to go through the psalm. We'll be working from the Hebrew text. Okay? And it's one way of honing up, uh, reviving your dying Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> so course notes required. Um, you'll be required to work with the Hebrew text. Um, you know, the technical one is the Stuttgartensia, that's for your exegesis, but uh, normally speaking, just bring in your Bible Society one, or you don't even have to do bring the Hebrew text in, I'll put the Hebrew text on OHP. So we'll be working from OHP, Hebrew text. Uh, but please bring in, every time, bring in uh, your own Bible. Now, just as far as Bibles are concerned, um, particularly with Psalms, most modern translations um, smooth and iron and dumb down the poetry. Now, one of the features about poetry is that it is multi-dimensional. Um, it's never just one thing. It has a whole range of dimensions to it. If you like, it's not black and white. It is multi-coloured. And it also has a music text to it, you know, so it's a a coloured picture with a musical accompaniment. Um, what do translations always do? They turn colour into black and white and they dumb down. And you have to do it. Uh, there's the old uh, saying, translator, traitor. Translator, traitor. Now one of the reasons you learn the original languages is to get some of the riches that are in the original text. So we need to work with the um, uh, Hebrew text. But also, if you want to know which are the most, uh, it's probably most helpful, although they're not, not, they don't communicate best, get the most literal translations. And the most literal translations that you get are the King James, King King James. James Version. is a formal equivalent. And the modern version of that, the new King James Version, is the most literal of all the modern translations and what it does when it adds a word for meaning is puts it in italics I'll give you one uh, example of that in the psalm we're going to look at shortly but uh, if not English Standard Version is the uh, most literal of the current modern ones but uh, guess which is the worst <laughs> the, yeah. not the NIV oh, good news good news Bible is terrible when it comes to psalms because it turns all the poetry into the most bland <coughs> prose and gets rid of the imagery and the music and colour everything's lost basically um, the other uh, book is that I've referred to is Encountering the Psalms um, uh, I, if any of you want a general uh, reading list, I could give you one that I have, but it's so huge that it's basically um, 
uh, impossible. If, 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 you're, if you just want to get some idea of what's been written on the Psalms, just in terms of monographs, just go into the Psalms section of the library and you can see the huge amount of material there. Um, I've cherry-picked a few of the key uh, texts as far as I'm concerned. Any questions on that? And just Sorry? ask if you have um, if you have any of this in PDF format that you could yeah you know, look electronic format you know uh, like everything that I have on you know yeah. topped out like this is available. You just email me oh, and yeah. um, uh, I can send it to you. Uh-huh. Um, and you can you can have it in advance and you can have it there and you can bring your computer and put stuff in if you want to. Mm-hmm. Um, I know. So, yes, any, any of this is available uh, uh, electronically. Uh, I won't automatically mail them to you because there's tons and tons of files and I don't want to uh, give it to people who don't need it. Now, I want to talk, uh, any questions, other questions generally on the course? So, two kinds of assignments, there's the analytical skills assignment and then there's the application of the basic skills in a uh, formal exegesis. Now, um, now can I make a general observation, not just about Psalms, but the whole of the Old Testament, much of the New Testament? uh, we, in, ever since the Enlightenment, we in the West have been trained in, the, uh, 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 in our whole education system to think abstractly. The whole of our Western enterprise is built on the process of abstraction. Now, the most extreme form of abstraction is mathematics. And science is also abstraction. Now, what is abstraction? It's the uh, 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 attempt to uh, uh, explain um, things in terms of concepts, ideas. And the purest ideas are mathematical ideas, in terms of ideas. And that's the way theology has been done in the West, at least since the Enlightenment, more and more. Okay, but it's an unnatural way of thinking. Most pe- people all over the world to the present day, and most of you, don't think in terms of ideas, concepts, but in terms of pictures, images. Pictures, images, that's the natural way. And that's the way the Bible's written, particularly the Old Testament. That, I don't know whether you realise, there are hardly any abstractions in the Old Testament. The language is concrete, visual, um, uh, sensory. Uh, it understands things, explains things in terms of pictures. Now, the technical term for a picture is image. And uh, uh, the use of pictures is imagery. Now, this uh, uh, you need to distinguish between that and the use of the imagination. Uh, okay, image is a picture. The ability to see a picture is imagination. Is that it? Imagination. Now, imagination in that sense has nothing to do with the the vulgar idea of. Uh, in, uh, imagination, which is fantasy. Okay, most of us use our imagination not to see what isn't, but to see what is. Now, to see um, the way things are and what is actually there in front of us. And the term imagery doesn't just have to do with the. It, it highlights the visual aspect. Can you hear? It's visual. Whereas abstraction is, has basically to do with the ear, what you hear, abstraction. Um, uh, uh, imagery has to do with what you see, but it has to do with all the senses. Um, not just what you hear with your brain, but what you hear with your ears, what you smell with your nose, what you taste with your tongue, what you touch with your hands and your body. Okay? So imagery has to do with that. 
It's seeing what is said. Now, I would put to you, and one of the, uh, uh, and this is one of the findings of uh, much work that's been done on language by philosophers and students of language, is that most of our language basically operates in terms of imagery, either more or less explicitly. Okay, now, I want to have a few things now to say about the use of imagery in Psalms, and I've given you a handout there to which summarises this. I'll see what you're saying. You see. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. It's too early, John. Yeah, uh, if you see what I say, you've got it. <coughs> uh, uh, I've noticed a shift in common language, by the way. People used to say, I understand uh, what you uh, say. Uh, now there's the shift to feeling. Uh, although some people, an increasing number of people say, instead of I understand, I see it. I get it. And until you see it, you don't get it. Oh, by the way, too, I was going to say that um, uh, one of the uh, writers in the New Testament that you need to get to grips with is Paul. Now, uh, you get run into a lot of difficulty if you try and understand terms like reconciliation, atonement, justification in terms of concepts. You won't get them until you see what the picture is in these terms. If you want to understand Paul or any part of the uh, exegesis, not just Psalm, get the picture and then you've got the idea. Get the picture, you've got the idea. Any questions on that? I hope I've made sense. This is not rocket science, it's really quite simple, but it's very, very profound in its implications. So it's what we're using poetry and music. Poetry, music, art, television. The whole of television has re-accentuated the fact that we communicate basically not abstractly, but visually, uh, in terms of pictures. And the essence of television is advertising, which is all to do with imagery. If you understand imagery, look at advertising. Um, it has all to do with imagery. Now, can you see that? OK. The use of imagery in the Psalms. Uh, the imagery of poetry consists of the picture language that it uses uh, to show us what it says. For all words, convey pictures as well as concepts. Um, uh, uh, you, you get the picture. You, it, it's not to, uh, to understand it, you need to see what it says. Um, the most reliable, concrete, uh, uh, deepest level of language always has to do with pictures. All the, we're using pictures all the time. Now, most of those pictures we use are cliches or dead metaphors. Politicians are masters at using cliches and dead metaphors. Just listen to Mr. Rudd and you'll hear one cliche after another. And uh, uh, Mr. Abbott too. Uh, uh, cliche is a... <laughs> cliche? Have you known the term cliche? A metaphor. Hmm? What? A metaphor. It's not a wet me it's, it's behind a cliche lies a metaphor or a simile, but it's worn down, and it's so its, its meaning has been lost. Light at the end of the tunnel, we're turning the corner. You've got to pick up your game, uh, step to the base. Uh, Military or, intelligence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an oxymoron. That's an oxymoron. oxymoron. Oh, it's just basically moronic. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, by the use of imagery, poets appeal to our imagination. Now, the imagination is the ability to see concretely, to see uh, uh, physically, by getting us to see what they say, and not only see what they say, but to see as they see somebody or something. So if I use imagery, um, you not only get to see what I'm seeing, 
but you get some idea of to, to get into my mind and you can see reality as I see it. You step into my shoes and you see as I see it. So this is particularly important for religious poetry and uh, the uh, Bible as a whole. Imagery doesn't just get us to see what God sees about us, the world, and he sees things differently, totally differently to us, but for us to, to see, not just what he sees, but to see as he sees. If you have, it gives us, uh, in some limited way, the eyes of God, the spectacles that he wears when he looks at his world and us. Even though imagery has to do with visualization, it also appeals to other senses, such as smell, taste, touch, and hearing, and it evokes their response. We say, that stinks. Now, that's using imagery, but it's not using visual imagery, it's using olfactory imagery, nose imagery. Like all religious poetry, the Psalms give us a vision of God, and ourselves in relationship to God. Psalms often use stock imagery to compare something unfamiliar and unknown, like God's character, to, with something that is familiar and well-known, like a rock. We'll be coming across this in the psalm we have a look at. Everybody knows what a rock is, so that's familiar. And one of the ways uh, you, 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 you enlarge your capacity to understand and experience is by going from the known to the unknown. Now, every teacher knows that that's the fundamental way of teaching. You start off with what's familiar known, and you use that to, to reach out into what is unfamiliar and complex and unknown. Um, so you stock images. Um, uh, but uh, very often in a new and surprising way. Now, uh, what you need to uh, watch out in the Psalms and the whole of the Bible is um, the deployment of the Kleinic principle. Now, the Kleinic principle is look for the unexpected, where you get something that is a cliche that's turned on its head. Now, something which is a, a worn-out picture, but it's turned around. I'll give you some cases of that shortly. Um, now, much of the power that's generated, uh, much of their power, that's the power images, is generated by the unconventional use of conventional images. Um, such as the claim in Psalm 1 verse 6, the psalm we're going to look at, that the Lord knows the way of the righteous rather than the righteous know his way. Now the religious cliche is, who are the righteous? The righteous are those who know, not abstractly, but experientially, and know from living, experiencing, they know the way of the Lord. Now, what does Psalm 1 do? Turns it on its head and says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And that's a puzzle because it's hard to understand. It takes something that's familiar, turns it around and opens up a whole new world to you just by that switcheroo. You understand what I'm saying? And I defy you to explicate fully that simple phrase, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of righteous. So you have something that is turned around and you get a revision of vision, a different way of looking at things. Now, the whole of the Bible is full of this and the Psalms are even fuller than the rest of the Bible. Um, uh, and you get a sense for this if you read around the Bible. You know, the cliches in the ancient world 
um, you know, the kind of stuff that would have been used for television advertising if there was television in the ancient world. And the way the Bible takes pagan images, all sorts of images, turns them around on their head. Be uh, sensitive to that. Since the point of the images is never fully explained, it triggers a process of meditation that leads to seeing something for yourself. You say, aha, I get it. Um, and using it to make sense of yourself and your own experience in life. Now, uh, one of the beauties about it, abstraction it explains and by explaining, it explains it away. Huh? So take, for example, one of the big abstractions we have in our society, the theory of evolution. It's an abstraction. It's a theory. Okay? It explains everything. And therefore explains away anything except itself. Huh? That's the danger. Now, um, however, what we don't realise is that the theory of evolution is not an abstraction, but it is in fact a, a myth, which is an extended metaphor. And one of the things about metaphors, imagery, is that it leads you not into explaining mysteries away, but leads you deeper and deeper into the appreciation of the ultimate inexplicability of everything even the simplest things. So imagery leads into an appreciation of mystery. Not by fuzzing, by mystifying, by confusing and bringing a fog on it, but through blinding light. You see, okay, you see things, but at any one point there's always other dimensions that are, uh, you, you can't fully see. Uh, because you can only see one thing at a time from one point of view. Uh, you, um, and just to explain another thing, so uh, uh, what an image requires you to do is not just to, to understand on the, you know, ab the abstract level, but you've got to have that, you've got, it need, forces you to meditate and to think for yourself. And there's two stages there. There's the aha, I see that itself. And then there's the second aha, which is the aha, I see how that makes sense of this and this and this and this and this. Huh? So you see it and then you use it to make sense of other things. There's those two ahas that are involved. Uh, so uh, meditation makes sense for yourself of what's being said and then using what's being said or what's given that picture to make sense of yourself, your own experience of life. Any questions on that? Now, spend some time because if I, could, if I had a, was in charge of education in the whole Western world, I'd bring about a whole revolution and I would, uh, 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 instead of making an education system focus on abstraction, mathematics, science, philosophy, all those abstractions, uh, I would turn them around, and I wouldn't get rid of these, but I'd teach them in a new way in terms of um, imagery. Any good scientist will tell you that when they make great discoveries, uh, they don't reach the discoveries by a process of abstraction, but a process of visualisation, imagination. And uh, that applies to everything. Now, four questions that you need to ask and answer, and like all these, this is a bit notional because it all runs together. Four questions you need to answer for the analysis of imagery in a psalm. The first is very, very simple. You've got to nail down uh, who or what is being spoken about. And let's say most psalms consist at least of three actors. There's God, there's the psalmist, and then there is the enemy or enemies. Okay? Now, you have this other actors too besides that, there's other subjects, but you nail down the subjects and then you ask the question, uh, uh, with these, say, let's just take three subjects, God, the psalmist, the imagery. Uh, uh, 
With what? With whom or what is God compared? <clears throat> with whom or what is the psalmist compared? With whom or what are the enemies compared? Because the, uh, uh, imagery also always involves comparison, not identity. God is a rock, is not identity, but saying that God is in some ways like a, like a rock. And what you need to work out then, what's left unexplained? How and to what extent God is like a rock. Huh? Um, uh, how, at least the second question, how is the one like the other? Thirdly, how is this image used elsewhere in this psalm and elsewhere in the Psalter and the Old Testament? Um, sometimes the image by itself is very puzzling. You can't, dis you can't read it. You can't see it. You understand it. The words are clear. Uh, but you can't see what it's getting at. Okay, now, quite often the clue to that, in most cases, the clue to that lies elsewhere in the same psalm. Because what you do, what good poetry does, is has two kinds of metaphors or imagery. There's the key metaphor, which is the picture that basically is unfolded, not just in one verse, but uh, across the whole psalm, or a number of key images. Um, which are, are gradually unpacked within the psalm. That's, uh, so you look within the psalm. If you can't get the clue there, then you look within other psalms because they operate with the same tradition of imagery. Um, if you can't get the clue there, then you go to the rest of the Old Testament. And in some cases, to get the full force of that, and usually but that, that's all you need to do, but to get to the full force of it, sometimes you've got to go elsewhere in the ancient world to, um, uh, you know, Egyptian theology or uh, uh, mythology, uh, Babylonian mythology, or what's close at hand is Canaanite um, poetry and imagery. So, um, uh, just on the last, a lot of the Psalms take what are basically Canaanite religious imagery and apply it to the Lord or the people of God and very often turn it around. We'll be coming across some cases of that. Can you see the way it works? You take what is pagan and it, that's what every missionary does um, uh, uh, use it and uses it then to explain what's different which is the Lord. Now you'd be familiar with that in your Chinese heritage. Uh, if I'm going to be a missionary in China, I've got to use the stock imagery of Chinese poetry, chi the various religions, Confucian, that kind of stuff, in order to communicate with Chinese people. Right? That's the way it works. Um, now that's a bit... Uh, uh, can you get the uh, force of that? It's like the unknown God of Paul. The unknown God of Paul is an abstract way of putting it. Uh, so can I ask, yes, then, um, when you're talking about imagery, in what what way is it differentiated from symbolism? So like the symbolism, symbolism is extended, is, is a particular kind of imagery. Okay, imagery is fairly general, but you get within imagery, you get similes, this is like that, metaphors, this is that, the Lord is a rock, the Lord is like a rock, a simile, the Lord is a rock, a metaphor, um, then you get an analogy, which is an extended metaphor. Now, this is, an, this is like that in these ways. You get an analogy. So, for example, there's an analogy in the New Testament between the church and a bride. Christ, the bridegroom. An analogy. It's not just a similarity at one point, but there's they, the, the one is used... Uh, to explain a number of features of the other. Um, then there's the use of allegory, which is very rare. Um, that's, the, the, that's the most abstract use of images, where you, where you concretize them. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read uh, that. Or um, this certain kind of allegory in The Lion, Witch and Wardrobe. Um, 
who's who's the Aslan? Yeah, Aslan. Etc. And so that's this allegory at work in the Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. Um, and then uh, there's symbolism, um, which is a system then of uh, 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 imagery. So you get a stock image as a symbol. So uh, everybody knows now that McDonald's. That's a symbol. Notice it, it's, 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 it, it works, doesn't work directly as a simile does. It doesn't say um, uh, McDonald's is like that letter M, but this stands for McDonald's. It's a figure uh, for McDonald's. Or this. Now, uh, can you see that's, it, but still it's, 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 it's imagery, but it's used in a very technical, specialised, stock conventional way. That's simple. So if it's pitch, uh, pictorially represented, then it would be an icon. An icon is, well, this in, in uh, uh, modern terms, not in classical terms, is an icon. So uh, uh, for modern advertising and modern society, uh, symbols are icons. Now, within this, there's a whole sub-range that I don't want to go the technicalities of it because I find that um, not terribly helpful. It's better to actually to deal with things case by case. The problem is that you put things into boxes when you go this way, which is not the way it works. Lastly, how does this image connect with the other images in the psalm to create a composite picture and tell its story like a series of shots in a commercial for television. Now, if you want to understand a psalm like the psalm we're going to look at shortly after the break, Psalm 92, uh, first of all, you've got to see all the separate pictures. But then what do you have to do? You've got to put them back together, not in the way that you want to put them back together, but you've got to run it in the sequence that the psalm sequences it. So you get uh, a series of pictures. You have one picture, and then you get a second picture, and maybe a third picture, which recalls this one and develops it. And then you get like that. Or sometimes you get multi-dimensional pictures. So you get five, six, seven all together running together, and it may be that five recalls this, uh, six goes back to this, and uh, five extends that. Can you see? There's, um, it's like a, you've got to turn what are stills into a movie. Um, now, uh, if you're going to interpret a psalm, and you get a sequence of pictures here, uh, there's two things that you, I'd like you to be sensitive. One is the key picture or the key metaphor. Now, what's the key metaphor going to be? What's the main? The main picture, the one that recurs. Right. So uh, here, in this case, the key metaphor would be this, this, and then you go uh, eight, nine, maybe that goes back here again. Oh, so key metaphor. You, you understand what I mean by key metaphor? So like the theme in a piece the of music. The theme in a piece of music. Uh, uh, yes, theme. And you can talk about it as the theme, but that's abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 scholars talk about key metaphors or main metaphors. Uh, and if you want to make sense of the psalm as a whole, then you need to understand all the other pictures in the light of that main picture. Can you see that? Um, lastly, if there is no main metaphor, which are going to be the most important ones? Quite obviously. Those that reoccur. Well, that, that's the main metaphor, key metaphor. But let's say, in some cases, you don't get one single main metaphor, a key picture. Think in terms of a television commercial. If you're going to make a good TV commercial, which are the most important pictures? 
The first and the last. That's where you look at. First and the last are going to be the drivers. Everything else is understood in the terms of the first and the last one. Okay? Uh, yeah, is that a lot? I think that. Yeah. Now, um, just to get you mulling over this stuff, let's have a look at the psalm that we're going to uh, 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 apply this to in a minute uh, before the break. Um, have you, I don't know what version of the Bible we've got, but most of you have got NIV, so I've brought the NIV with me. Um, let's read it through so it's sitting in the back of your mind, and we'll come back to it after the break. Psalm 92. And I've chosen this deliberately because it's not well known, and so therefore uh, you don't have a lot of pre-understanding to it. Um, James, can you read it, please? It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your man, O Most High, to declare your selfless love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the will. For you, O Lord, made me glad by your work. At the works of your hand I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. That though the wicked sprout like grass and all evil doers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold your enemies, O Lord. For behold your enemies shall perish. All evil doers shall be scattered. That you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree, and grow like secret Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in an old age. They are ever full of sap and green. Yet later the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in me. Now there's three basic subjects in this psalm. What are the basic subjects? The people or things that are spoken about. There's God. There's the psalmist. The enemies. And actually there's a fourth one. The righteous. So you get a scenario, if you like a drama, there's four actors. The main actor is God. The next main actor is Psalmist. And then you get two other subgroups. There's the enemies, and then there are the righteous. Okay? Um, now, uh, just one thing that I'd put to you before you go to the break um, to illustrate the principle of translator traitor. Uh, can, you can you read again that in your translation? Verse 11. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil sayings. Okay, has anybody got a different translation? New King James. Yep. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. And um, does any, is anything done with desire there in that text? It's an italics. It's an italics, which indicates what? As added. It's added. What's the original form? Just cut out desire and you've got the Hebrew, which we don't have time to look at. My eyes have seen... Yes. On my enemies, actually. It is. My eyes have looked or seen something, X, on my enemies. And my ears have heard X on my opponents. Now what strikes you about that? Why is it that all translations add something there? It doesn't make immediate sense. Now, um, what translations do is they dumb it down and they do your thinking and meditating for you and they put X marks the unknown and it ceases to be an X and it becomes a no. So take something that's meant to get your thinking um, 
and puts the does it for you. Uh, but notice that it's X, it's unknown. Uh, now, there's many cases of that, but this is a fairly dramatic case. My eyes have looked on my enemies. Uh, usually, uh, uh, look has an uh, see, or see the something on my enemies. My ears have heard the something on my enemies, or my ears, ears have heard on my enemies, or about my enemies. My eyes, the most literal level would be, my eyes have looked at my enemies, and my ears have heard about my enemies, about my assailants. Now, what's unknown there is what is heard and what is seen. A riddle. Now, a riddle is a puzzle. Uh, what this translation does is dumb, all translations do, is dumb down and turn a riddle into a statement. Let's have a break and we'll uh, go through this and analyse the imagery after the break. Now you all have the handouts, do you?